ladies and gentlemen, grab a seat. We're going to get started. Come on in. Grab a seat. Grab a seat. No, it'll be fine. No, we'll do it right back here. We'll be fine. I just don't want to take the time to move it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start things off with a game. So here's what I need. Oh, do you want to know the scores as is? Okay. Currently, both teams have points. <laughs> Team Sonic has a certain number. But Team Mario has a different number. All right, so now that you are all caught up on the scores, I need Youth workers, I need your help. Youth workers, I need one guy from each youth group, but they need to be the strongest guy you've got. Oh, Holyoke has no strong guys. Yikes. I'll take a buff girl. <laughs> I need one guy from every youth group right up here. Can you help me? One balloon for each guy, please. Yes, sir. Go to the All right, ladies and gentlemen. One of my favorite games I mentioned it earlier, possibly the greatest game ever made. Does anybody remember the name of that game? Legend of Zelda. Okay, Legend of Zelda, the character you play as is Link. So we are gonna play a variation of The Weakest Link. All right? We're gonna put you gentlemen. We're gonna put you gentlemen through a series of physically demanding tests. They're super hard, because we have so much active space to work with here. The first thing you have to do, you're gonna be given 60 seconds. You have to blow that balloon up until it explodes in your face, because that's just fun to watch. All right. On your mark, get set. Plank. Sixty seconds on the clock. Get down. Get down. For the rob, if you help me, keep an eye out. If they dip, quiet. If you dip at all, if you dip or a knee drops at all, you're automatically out. We'll be watching. Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go! Put your butt down a little bit. He's up, he's good. 
He just has dangly pants. Who's gonna win? Thousand points for Team Sonic. Got 20 seconds left, guys. 20 seconds. You know what? We're gonna add 30 seconds to this. 30 more seconds. Keep going. We're gonna need your help in just a second. Thank you. All right, 15 seconds left. 15 seconds. All right, help count me down. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, you made it. You can relax. Stand up, stand up. They all made it. All right, shh, listen. Next up, gentlemen, I need you to spread out a little bit, and I need you to put your arms. Straight out, spread out, spread out, spread down that way, spread down, go, 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 spread out, spread out. All right, guys, shh, listen, palm up, you're gonna, if you would, put a songbook in each hand. What? Okay, yeah, grab a songbook, grab, just give them each two songbooks, one for each hand, one songbook for each hand, right in your palms. One in each hand, one in each hand, palms up. Sorry, we had more make it than I thought. All right, hang on. Does he know where they're at? Okay. All right, and gentlemen, uh, Brother Rob, we're going to need like double this. Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to give you 60 seconds on the clock, and at some point when I deem fit, we are going to double the number of songbooks on your hands. All right, gentlemen, palms up, hands stretched out, elbows locked, and go. Elbows locked. Elbows locked. Oh, we brought the whole cart of songbooks in. Yes. I'm, I'm amazed Sam can do this. Look at the size of his arm. We should really find out if any of these guys are ticklish. That would just be awful. All right, gentlemen, if you'll help me add a songbook to each hand. One songbook on each hand. Just stack it up there from right up on here, right up on here. One on each hand without throwing them. Careful, you have to... Keep holding it. All right. Keep holding it. Elbow locked. Elbow locked. There you go. Elbows locked. Oh, we're losing him. Wow, his elbows go backwards. He's like part horse. Are you dying? Are you dying? Are you dying? All right, guys, let's add one more. Oh, he's down. We got one down. Elbows locked. Up, up, up. Oh, we got two down. Elbows locked, elbows out, elbows out. All right, we got three down. All right, 15 seconds, 15 seconds.
Grab a bottle. Grab a bottle. Grab a bottle. Grab one. All right. You have 30 seconds. 30 seconds on the clock. You have to land a bottle flip. 30 seconds on the clock. From a full standing upright position. Standing all the way upright. Go. Oh, we got one. You got two. Keep going until you get it. Oh, we got three. You got 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, that's it. It's time. All right, you two, you're gone. All right, gentlemen. 60 seconds are on the clock. You have to do as many push-ups as you possibly can in 60 seconds. Get down. On your mark. Top two. Top two. Chest to the ground. Chest to the ground. Top two will advance to the final round. What? Uh, Brother Miller, can you count over here? Brother Rob, you count here. Brother Calvin, can you count? All right. On your mark. Get set. Top two will advance to the final round. On your mark. Get set. Go. Right there. It's only been 15 seconds. <laughs> How many of you are really glad you're not these three guys? Yeah. All right, 30 seconds are gone. Twenty seconds. Dude, you're doing girl push-ups. Come on, all the way down. Fifteen seconds left. Fifteen seconds. <laughs> all right, count them down with me. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop. Further up. These two guys had the most. But you know what? I have enough to do three. Should I let them in? Yeah. All right. By the grace of Tim, you're staying in, all right? Bring those up here. All right, guys, your last challenge is all about your brain. You have to eat this freeze pop as fast as possible. Run to the back corner of the auditorium. Shh, shh. Listen. You have to run to the back corner of the auditorium. You'll find a piece of paper that has a ridiculous multiplication problem on it. There's a piece of paper and a pen. You have to eat the entire thing, run to the back, solve the problem. First person to come back to me with the correct answer wins 10,000 points for your team. Plus, plus three extra entries for your church in our drawing. On your mark. Get set, go! <laughs> shove it in, shove it in! Level up. Alright, let's give away an extra thousand points! Boom!
silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold than to be the king of a vast domain. Hope you can sing it from your heart. I'd rather have Jesus. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we're going to have some 
I don't want to say brief, um, but uh, I'm just going to ignore him from now on. Maybe that'll cause him to stop. But, <laughs> um, but uh, we're going to have some, I, they're not split sessions because obviously everybody's together, but uh, kind of focus sessions is, uh, is what this is. And to kind of right back to back is what we're going to do. Uh, I've asked Brother Calvin Allen to come and, uh, and teach you guys for a little bit about music. And obviously, you know, uh, music is, is a huge part of uh, Brother Calvin's life and uh, just uh, a, a has, you know, he travels all over the country singing and, and preaching, obviously, but uh, uh, I know it means a lot to him and uh, personally and not just music in general, but the teaching of what is right music and how to choose right music. And I've, I don't know what direction he's going to take with it. I kind of gave him a little bit of liberty on that, but uh, it's one of the areas that I know needs to be addressed and I don't think can be addressed too often because it is, it is uh, an enormous way that Satan tries to get his way into our lives is through music and a very, very important subject. I hope you'll pay attention and uh, Brother Calvin, I'm not sure you have the lapel on. Okay, you're good. All right, take it away. message this morning, but uh, no, I had a little bit to do with my message this morning. I'm going to start my timer, Brother Rob. You gave me 15 seconds? Yeah. Okay, good. But uh, no, I, the truth is, as a musician, you know, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we can evoke mo emotions out of you yeah. like very few people can. Yeah. When I started playing that, you know, the, the Twilight thing, most of us that are older in here, we start, na 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 I got scared to go look under my bed now. <laughs> then we played that Jaws theme. Da -da, da -da. I heard, I saw a man the other day, he played on the, on the violin, and he, he started playing the Mario. How many, have you seen that video? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, he started playing the Mario Brothers theme on the violin. I thought that was the most genius thing I'd ever heard of in my life. I saw another man the other day, he, uh, he started playing with a, with a chicken. You know what I'm talking about, the chickens that you squeeze? And y'all, you know, you know what video I'm talking about? What did he play? Cannon, and D. Cannon was it Cannon and D? Yeah. It was, it was unbelievable. My old college music teacher, she said, I've seen it all, amen. <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, music can evoke those emotions. That, that last song I was playing, I kind of played the beginning and kind of the end, the build-up climax to that song. It was called The Judgment. That song is so powerful, it starts off, you know, All is still, heaven is silent, as the mighty judge ascends the throne. But then by the end of it, I see every knee is bowing, every hand in honor is raised. I mean, it's just like this huge anthemic theme by the end of the song. What a powerful thing music is. And so I've spoken on music. I've taught music for years. I've been a, a musician. I've not, um, I've been a musician for years and years. And, and I don't call myself a musician per se. And I'll talk about that in a minute here, but um, I've been involved in music from before I was saved. I mentioned before I got saved when I was 11 years old, but before that time I was raised in my house. Uh, we grew up, every, especially every Saturday, we listened to oldies in my house. And so every, every Saturday when we were cleaning the house, it was put on the oldies and, and uh, sweating to the oldies, cleaning it up. Amen. And most of you kids don't even know what that is, but uh, we'll ask Brother Ramos later. And... Uh, <laughs> How's, how's a Puerto Rican guy call himself Ramos, amen? It's Ramos, amen? Jorge Ramos. Doesn't that sound more powerful than Ramos? From now on, let's call him Brother Ramos. And uh, the sad thing is I think I speak more Spanish than he does, amen? But uh, you learn how to learn, say enchilada and tostada, you speak more than I do, amen? But... Uh, I, I got involved in music, and I grew up listening to, to and I'm glad I didn't listen to rap, okay? Um, I wasn't really allowed to listen to that kind of stuff. Even, when, even as a lost young man, I wasn't allowed to listen. Of course, there was, no, there was no hardcore rap back then. It was just beginning in its infancy stages, but listened to a lot of other kinds of music, but, but mostly a lot of oldies music, and, and so we grew up on that kind of music in our house, but I discovered very young in life that we could create a mood with music better than anything else. One of my cousins who is, uh, was a preacher boy at our church, and man, could he preach. And he graduated from the same Christian school I did years later, and he's actually uh, become a well-known uh, DJ in the, the Midwest area. And I, I thought it was so interesting how the Lord has allowed me to open doors and be able to sing, and uh, really almost around the world. I got to sing with Dr. Rick Martin's choir and orchestra over in the Philippines a couple years ago. I mean, they've got a 100-piece a orchestra there, and and just hundreds of choir members there, and I got to sing with that choir and orchestra, and I thought, man, what, a, what an honor that was just to be able to sing with them, and, and I've sung in Haiti before, I've sung in uh, all over Canada and the United States, of course, and, and uh, God's allowed me to do that and, and, to, and to build, and of course, I sing, so I, I, I basically feel like I'm getting ready for the preacher when I sing, and so I'm creating a mood, if you will, uh, for the Word of God to be preached, and I thought it was very interesting how we're both being used in the area of music, one of us is trying to create one mood and another one's trying to create another mood. You understand what I mean? So God has allowed me to be involved in music. I, was, I went to Bible college and I had no idea what my major was going to be. I mean, I literally, I knew God called me to preach, but I didn't feel like he wanted me to be a pastor or a missionary. I just knew I was called to preach and I knew I was, I was musical. I started, uh, I had some piano lessons in fourth grade, but I quit because my teacher was, well, she was a little mean. <laughs> Her name was Mrs. Rushnick. She was as rough as her name was, amen. And so I stopped that, and when I was in, uh, later at junior high, I played the upright bass. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I played that song once for a concert, and I did not get a standing ovation. But anyways, <laughs> years later, I started playing bass guitar in church. A man built me an acoustic bass guitar in church, and, and uh, so I went to Bible college, and I was like, man, I, don't, I have no idea, but I know God's given me some musical talent, so I majored in in uh, church music and in music education. And I know that's hard to believe. I, 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 that's, just, that's just my major. I, they wouldn't let me take preaching classes, Brother Ramos. Uh, Ramos. And uh, <laughs> they wouldn't let me take preaching classes because it didn't fit in my you know, prescribed course and everything out there. Man, I, so one of these days, I'm going to learn how to preach one of these days if God will help me. But I began to learn how to write music. And I learned how to... Uh, write really what you look at in a hymn book that I learned how to write four-part harmony music and I didn't even know how to play the piano. When I would write things and or, uh, or, um, arrange things, I'd have to have somebody else play it for me or I'd have to kind of sing it by ear. And uh, so after I got done with college, I, was, I, I 
came home to the church, Brother Rob's very nice church, and I decided, you know, if I, gotta, if I can write this music, I better learn how to play it. And so I used to practice for four hours a day. And really, Brother Rob and his brother and several other young men, I started a quartet. And I really just started that quartet so I could learn how to accompany people. And so uh, don't blame the singing on me. No, but he does a great job at it. But I, I started with their group, one of the first groups that I started working with, to learn how to play the piano. And uh, we had some good memories of drinking at the Springs of Living Water. <laughs> we won't talk about that one. But, uh, but uh, one of the fellows in the group, he, just, he couldn't. Anyways, but he was, I think he was half special. But anyways, <laughs> turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 68. And I'm just giving you, while you turn that, I'm giving you a little background on my music. So I became the music director at Faith Baptist Church in, in our church for, and I was that for four, almost 14 years. I was the music director of the church. And what a privilege it was. And, but I, all through those years, I taught music. Brother Rob, uh, matter of fact, when he became a Christian school teacher and he was going to teach a music class, I sent him a ton of my notes on music. And so I don't think he has this lesson here because I have some other ones, but I thought you might have stole those already. So I know Brother Ramos stole my message this morning for tonight. So we're just, just kidding. Psalm chapter number 68. Let's take a look at this. I just want to give you, I'm going to rapid fire, give you some things on music. This is not a sermon per se, but I'm going to give you some guiding principles to help you in this area of music. Then we'll try to bring it home before my time is up here. Psalm chapter number 68. And I'm just going to jump right into it, uh, give you as many of these principles as I can. Psalm chapter number 68. Let's take a look at verse number 25. The Bible says, uh, go back up to verse 24. The Bible says, they have seen thy goings, O God, even thy goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. So we're dealing with music inside of God's church here. We're dealing with music where? Inside the? Okay. And where are God's people? They ought to be inside the? So he's dealing with God's people coming to God's house, and he's dealing with God's music here. In verse number 25, he says this. In the church, in the sanctuary, here's what happened. The singers went before. The players on instruments followed after. And among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. I want you to understand, number one here, I'm just going to give you uh, a very, uh, like I said, a rapid fire, a kind of a lesson this, this afternoon. I think I got 20 minutes left here. And so I want you to understand, number one, God's music always has order to it. God's music has an order or a pattern to it. If you look at those scriptures there, now, I'm one of those people that believe the Bible, and I believe every word of the Bible. Amen. I believe God put everything in the Bible on purpose. Uh, I, I believe, listen, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe the cover too. It says Holy Bible on there. And I believe it's God's word. And God never said oops or uh-oh when he was writing his word. Right. And so here's how God described his music. He said, he said, listen, the singers went before. And then he said the players on instruments followed after them. And then he said among them were the, da were the, were the damsels with timbrels. You say, Brother Alan, what was God trying to say to us? God was trying to say to us, number one, the melody is the most important part of music. Right. That which we communicate with, the, the, the tune of the song and the singers in music, and I'll, I'll emphasize this in a second here a little more, that's the most important part of the music. And then the instruments, what are they doing to add to that music? And then the, what we call that harmony there, and then the rhythm comes next. You know, God put those words in there, and he said, he said the singers went before. They had the most prominent position were the singers and the melody and the tune and the words of that music. And I may emphasize a little bit later, but you understand, people, young people, the most important part of your music is what is the message that's being conveyed? Right. What kind of message is being conveyed by the music you listen to? Is it a message of, of, of uh, is it a sexual message, is it a sensual message? Is it a message of, of hope? Is it a message of the Lord? Is it, a, is it the gospel? Is it a message of rebellion? Whatever your music is, you ought to be able to take inventory of it and say, what's the primary goal, what's the main thing about the music that I'm listening to? And young people, when we put any of this out of order, we begin to have corrupt music. We begin to get, go against the recipe that God has for music, okay? For example, some people are more concerned with the harmony part, how does it sound versus what the message is. 
I was in a Christian school and I was, I was, I, I watched the old show and I don't, I don't usually bring up TV shows while I'm preaching and I will quote them, but I don't bring them up. But anyways, and I was in this, I was in a Christian school and I was new to the Christian school. Some of you know what this is like, or you go to a public school and I mean, you don't know all the, you know, the, the rules of the church and you don't know what you're supposed to say and not supposed to say. And, and, you know, you keep messing up and saying wrong things and, and, uh, and I was one of those guys that I came to the Christian school, I mean, raw. I mean, I just, I didn't know anything. And so I was in the hallway, and I used to watch the old show, The Wonder Years. And I'm, sit, I'm sitting here in the hallway, and I, and I started singing the song, you know. Uh, and I won't sing the whole thing, but I was like, you know, what would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? And our Christian school teacher, Brother Jeff, poked his head in the hallway, and he said, what in the world are you singing? And I had a heart attack just like she did over there and I screamed. No, not you. The other girl. Whenever I used to say who, whenever I used to say who growing up, I said, Mom, who? She said, the owl on your shoulder. You don't get it, do you? Nope. Me neither. I just laughed. Okay. <laughs> but I started singing that song and he's, he's like, what are you doing, son? And he's about to give me 25 demerits. And I'm like, I'm just singing the theme of the Wonder Years. He said, do you know what the words say? I'm like, no, it sounds like a cool song, though. And the chorus is, getting high with a little help from my friends. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I'm like, well, I'm a soccer bus. We, no, I was kidding. But, but all, I, all I cared about was, man, this sounds cool. Man, that's how, I mean, you see this song here? Man, that's such a sad song. And, you know, and, and I don't want to bring up some of the songs of the world today, but there, there's some old songs, one of them, uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's some of these songs, I went through a list a while ago of wedding songs that are actually horrible songs to sing at a wedding. You know, the, one of the popular songs of years ago is I Will Always Love You. And it's about breaking up with somebody where people were singing it at their weddings. Because they didn't care what the words actually said. It was just like, oh, this just makes me feel gushy because it sounds good. Young people, we never choose music just because of the way that it makes us feel. And listen, this goes for Christian music too. Just because the music and the chords that they play together make you feel tingly doesn't make it right music. There's a lot of music today in Christianity that makes you feel nice and ooey and gooey like the middle of a s'more on the inside. But they've got no more message than anything else out there. I call it cotton candy choruses. They don't really say much. They don't, uh, 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 we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you more. We love you and we feel it and we love you. And I can't tell whether you're singing to your boyfriend or Jesus or, but it sounds good. She said, I don't have a boyfriend, we know. And uh, yeah, I'm just kidding. Appreciate you. But you understand, when that music gets out of order, I don't want, and then we've got the music that, here we go. I, man, if it's got a good beat, it's got to be good. And many of us, man, if we could just, you know, they can hear us. I remember there, one time we were sitting in church, in our church, and we were in a busy city, and all of a sudden you could, you could feel like a rumbling in the bottom of your stomach. You ever been around the car where you, you can feel it like two blocks away? You don't even know what it is. Just, I'm sorry. It's, and you just feel that in the pit of your stomach. And there are some that are more concerned with, does it have a good beat? Is it, is it beady? Does it get my flesh going? And I don't have time to go into all the flesh versus the spirit this morning. But what I'm saying is God made it very clear. This is how it ought to be. I want the emphasis on the message of the song first. And if the message is wrong, listen, we can stop there. Do not collect $200. Do not pass go. That's the wrong kind of music. So what are the words of my music saying? Then what does it sound like? And then is there a beat to this music that's pleasant? Now, God's not against beats. But he's against us emphasizing the beats versus the message of the song. Next here, number two. God gave us a new song. Song chapter number 40. Here's what he said. 
Psalm chapter 40, of course, he, this man gets saved. I waited patiently, Lord, he get hurt. He, he, he put me out of a horror. By the way, verse number 2 in Psalm chapter 40, here's what that means. It says, he brought me up out of a horrible pit. If you begin to study that, young people, it, it means a pit of noise. So God brought us out of this pit of noise, and here's what he did for us. And he put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. And here's the difference. I mean, they're going to see it, they're going to fear, and they're going to trust in the Lord. God said, he brought me out of this horrible pit, this pit of just a bunch of noise. And by the way, that's most of the world's music is just a bunch of noise. And it doesn't matter what the words are. It's just uh, one, one of the musicians, I forget who it is. Um, it may come back to me in a second. I've got the quote somewhere else on my iPad here. But he, he talked about how they said, he said, if we can get them excited, we can preach into their subconscious what we want them to believe. Wow. Wow. I had a young man in our church. He was, he's got, he's, he spent his life in addiction for years. He's gotten the victory now. He just graduated several, you know who I'm talking about, from the Reformers Unanimous home there. And uh, I'm talking about heroin. I'm talking about just, just uh, some of the craziest drugs you can imagine. Almost lost his life about a year ago. God cleaned him up. But I remember one time I was cutting his hair. And he said to me, before he ever got right with God, it was one of the times he was starting to kind of come back, but he went out into the world again. Here's what he said to me. He said, Brother Allen, he said, I remember those songs we used to sing in junior high. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross. He said, man, I remember those songs. And he said, here's the crazy thing, Brother Allen. And he wasn't even right with God at this moment. Here's what he said to me. He said, I found out after being three years in the world, he said, I looked around one day and he said, I realized that I was doing everything the music told me to do. He said it was, like, it, it, it was like a light bulb went on in my head. He said, everything my music was telling me to do, that's exactly, I was, I, was, I, was, I was messing around with girls and I was messing around with drugs and I, I didn't care what anybody thought. I had a spirit of rebellion about me and I, had a, I, had a, I lived my life apart from God because that's exactly what the music was preaching to me. You understand that good music can do the same thing? You understand that when you sing music about praising God and lifting up the name of Jesus, it inspires you the same way that the world's music does. And he said, people are going to see you sing that song, and they're going to fear or have a reverence for God, and they're going to begin to trust in Jesus because of the songs that you sing. Young people, God wants to take that song that right now is occupying some of your hearts and minds and heads and iPods, and he wants to put some new songs in there. He wants to give you a song that brings reverence and praise to God that points back to him and not you and not your flesh and not yourself and not the girl and not the boy you like, but he wants to point back to God himself. You see, God's music is a new song. I want you to understand something about the new song versus the old song. You see, when I was growing up, I mean, there was so many, and there was popular music of that day, and there's always going to be more popular music, and there's going to be more popular musicians. But I want, you, I want to contrast that old song with the new song for a few seconds here. The old song offers us no hope. Most of the music some of you listen to, if you listen to secular music, when it really gets down to it, it's almost like, well, you might as well live it up now because we got no hope. I mean, we popular when I was a young person. I mean, they'd sing songs about love as if it, man, it was this lo lost, hopeless cause. You know why? They didn't know Jesus Christ. They didn't know God. They didn't know that God was love. And so therefore, not knowing God, they didn't know true love. And so they never offered you any hope in this world. And the best they could tell you is live for right now because this is as good as it gets. But the new song offers us the blessed hope. The old song offers us no true love. It, it offers us a sensual life. It offers us a life of, man, if, if I could just get the next thrill, if I could just get the next pleasure, if I could just have that girl to get my hands on him or get my hands on that boy. The new song offers us a true love from God the Father and abundant life in Jesus Christ. The old song offers us a temporal focus. The new song offers us an eternal focus on our lives. Number next, I got to hurry here. Number three, God's music, God's music never, I want you to understand this and understand what I mean. I'll, I'll read the scripture to you. God's music does not sound like war. 
In Exodus chapter number 32, if you're taking notes this morning, in verse number 17 and 18, the Bible says there was a noise of war. Of course, Moses is going up. He's got the Ten Commandments. He's coming off of the mountaintop. And the Bible says he hears the noise of war in the camp. He says, is it, the, is it the voice of them that cry from being overcome? But listen to what he says. He says, it is the voice of them that sing do I hear. Moses came down off this mountaintop and he said, listen, he said, the voices that I'm hearing, he said, it sounds like war is going on. I don't have time to expand on this, but I think it's very interesting that you look at the history of Western music and you can even look at the history of Eastern music. The dominant instrument in war times has always been the drum or a percussion instrument. You check it out in the Native Americans. You check it out with the Africans. You check it out with the Europeans. You check it out with the Revolutionary War. Most of the time, they carried a drum and a bugle boy with them. And they knew that if I played this certain beat, if I played this certain thing like Reveille, or if I played taps, most of us in here would stand with our hands over our heart because the music was indicating to us, you guys, it's, it's time to do something. And that music of war that he's talking about here he said, boy, it seems like people are, are the noise of war and it's crying and it's and the devil's music has always sounded like war. Next. By the way, here's some of the fruit of that noisy war, that noisy music. Confusion. False worship. You know what I've learned? Here, here we go, young people. I've got... I, I found that Christian young people sometimes aren't as honest as the devil's crowd is. Here's what, here's what they say about their own music. Rock and roll has always been the devil's music. That's what they say about their own music. I got country music artists, I got quotes from them that literally say, we are contributing to the moral decay of our country. And young people, that's from, that's from a fella who was over 50 years ago singing that music. You know, one fellow said, you know what you get when you, when, you, when you play country music backwards? It used to be where the rock and rollers, they would, they would play the music backwards. They call it backmasking. And they would, they, would, they would, I mean, literally sometimes you could play their music backwards and you'd hear them say, hail Satan. You know what you get when you play country music backwards? You get your wife, your truck, and your dog back, amen? Some of y'all don't listen to country music. You don't have a clue what I'm just talking about. But it offers us a false sense of worship. And many of us today, we wonder why, man, I can't get involved in church. And boy, I would love to be involved and, and, and feel what you guys feel. And when people shout and they get excited, you know why that is? It's because we are focused on music that brings about a spirit of worship in our lives. The, you, ever, you, ever wonder, you ever wonder, why do we sing before preaching? Can I tell you this? It's not to fill a time gap. Brother Ramos and I, we... Ramos and I, we can preach long enough without music. What we're trying to do, young people, is create a spirit of worship Amen. in this place. Amen. This is why we choose the songs that we do. This is why we sing like songs like, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Why? Because God's music is going to create the atmosphere of true worship. Let me challenge you this, young people. Some of you live in homes that it's not very Christian in your home. I made up my mind as a young person, I don't care what's being played outside of my room, I'm going to play worship music in my room. And I'm going to tell you, my, my, some of my relatives listen to some of the foul filthiest, most vile music you could ever listen to. And I'd be listening to songs like I'm glad I'm serving a God who's able to deliver. And I'm not trying to say I'm anything spiritual, but what I was doing was inside what I could control, young people. And I understand many of you are bus kids or you, you, you're, you're not raised in a Christian home. And listen to me today. I, you can create a spirit of worship in your life on your own. And you, when you're going through a tough time, you know, you need to find some songs in your life that are going to bring you to a place of worship. You need to find, listen, in your car, on your way to work, when you're, in, when you're alone in, uh, by yourself, listen, you need to learn what it is to cultivate an atmosphere and a desire and a spirit of worship where you are. Many of us have allowed too long the devil's music to occupy that place of worship in our hearts. 
And if you're not careful, the opposite of that young man and what he experienced is going to be your experience, which is everything the music told you to do, you started to do. But we want to create an atmosphere for worship. And I'm skipping a lot this morning. I got I to gotta hurry. I got like three seconds left. Here's another side effect of this war music. Sensual dancing. Excuse making. Nakedness. Judgment of God. Number four, I got to hurry here. God's music teaches and corrects us. So uh, Colossians chapter number three, verse 16, the Bible says this. We are to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. God's music is able to teach us. And by the way, I believe the number one thing that our young people are missing is good music about the character of God. We, we live in a day and an age where Christianity has become, uh, what do I feel about God instead of who God is? Listen, I, and again, I'm not against some of that. I like testimony songs. I sing songs like I owe it all to you, Lord. As, but I'm telling you, there's something about singing music that speaks to the character of Almighty God. Yeah. The reason being is, again, it points back to the other one, which it brings us to a spirit of worship. How many of you know the song, Be Thou My Vision? There's something about singing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Listen, there's something about singing a song about the character of God. There's something, uh, something about singing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. There's something about he's fairer than lilies of the rarest bloom, and he's sweeter than honey from out of the comb. What it's doing is it's cultivating an appetite of worship in us, and it is teaching us and admonishing us with the psalms and hymns and spiritual song number five here. God's music comes from the heart. Colossians 3.16 says, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Number six, God's music, and I believe this is probably the most important part of it all. God's music is a means to a spirit-filled life. God's music is a means to a spirit-filled life. Young people in Ephesians chapter number five, you've heard it quoted before, many of you. Bible says, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves, and he tells us how, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Young people, you know, I want God to use me. You know, one of the best things you could do is learn as a young person to enjoy the music of God. So I don't have the best voice. Nobody, listen, God said just make a joyful noise. And I heard some of y'all sing, it's a noise. But God doesn't care about the way you sing. God's not looking at the quality of your voice. What he's looking for is a group of young people that want to be filled and walk in the spirit of God and that want God in their lives. Amen. And the best, one of the best ways to do that is to begin to enjoy God's music because it is a means to a spirit-filled life. You ever wonder why most of, the, most of the young people that sing in your church are also some of the best soul winners in your church? I'm not saying every single case, but I'm saying sometimes the young people that are the most involved in church because it is a means, they fall in love with the music of God, and it becomes a means to a spirit-filled life. Number six, God puts, and listen to this, God puts the emphasis on singing and not listening to music. Y'all hear me? God puts the emphasis in the scriptures on singing and not listening to music. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The one that I can find out the most about listening to music, it, says, it talks about hearing the rebuke of wise rather than hearing the song of fools. But God's word, that's my alarm going off, I got three seconds. God's word puts the emphasis on singing. Not on listening to music. Listen, I enjoy Christian music. I got a CD from Brother Ramos. I got a, I got a CD from Brother Rob and uh, Ramos and Rob. I got a CD from those. Guys. Listen, I love listening to me. I didn't make 10 CDs because I don't like listening to music. But some of us put Christian music on as background noise instead of participating in it and it coming from our heart to the ears of God. And young people, it's not enough for you to go buy a bunch of CDs, although I want you to buy mine, okay? But don't just listen to it. Sing the songs of God. Amen. Number next here. Number seven, God's music and Satan's music can never harmonize. 
There's a, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says this, What concord hath Christ with Belial? That word concord there, if, you, if you're a musician here, you, know, you understand what a chord is. Music, a, a, new, a, a note that's a major third or a minor third above that, or a, minor, a major third built on uh, a minor third there. You can have a minor chord, you can have a major chord, and uh, all augmented and diminished, all that kind of stuff. But basically it means things that harmonize together, they sound good together. And the Bible says there is no concord with Christ and Belial. Let me put it this way. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. And some of you that are struggling in your music today, it is stifling your spiritual growth. It is stifling your worship for God. Because they cannot coexist. It's hard to sing the songs of the world. I don't, even, I don't want to mention the musicians of the world. But it, whoever your favorite musician is, that group or that person, it's kind of hard to sing the songs of God when you've got their songs on your lips, isn't it? Because there's no harmony there. There's no harmony in the message. There's no harmony in the methods. There's no harmony in the master or the mode. Number eight. Singing is for God, not the performer. Singing is for God and not the performer. Listen, man, and some of you, you've been doing a pretty good job this week, but I'm going to tell you, some of you are so worried about what that person next to you is going to say. And instead of enjoying this meeting and enjoying the things of God, we're more worried. Listen, it's not about you. And you young people that sing, you better. Brother Rob knows this. He sung for me for many, many years. He knows this. I, I, there was a young man that was in his group. And he said, he said Brother Allen, will you help us record? And I said, I'll help you. But I, I said this. I said, why do you want to record? Here's what he, he said to me. He said, well, it's to get our name out there. And you know what I said? I'll never help you record. Don't you want to help young people? Yeah, I want to help young people. But I want to help young people get a true spirituality and true worship going on. And, not, and see, that's the problem with these contemporary singers and this bunch of worldly Christian singers, too, because it's all about them. We had a young man from our church, he decided, he decided he's going to start a Christian pop group. Say, what's that? That's like Christian crap. There's no such thing. Unless you buy it from me, then it's, no. He said, Brother Allen, we're going to start a Christian pop group. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, why are you starting that group? He said, well, we want to see people get saved. I said, oh, that's a noble goal. I said, how are you going to do that? He said, oh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to all the youth groups, and we're going to get all the youth groups together, and then we're going to sing to them in this big auditorium. Man, it's going to be a great time. I said, wait, I thought you wanted people to get saved. If you want people to get saved, listen, don't go to the youth groups. Go to the public schools. But see, the emphasis was he wasn't wanting to lift up Jesus Christ. He was wanting to lift up himself. And he wanted to be a Christian pop star. He didn't want to be a usable vessel and a servant for Jesus Christ. God's music is about him. It's not about us. And yet the world's music, the number one focus is us and self. Next and lastly here, I guess I'll give you this and I'll shut up. God's musicians, listen to this, God's musicians are never only musicians. You start to look at the scriptures. And the scriptures are an amazing thing. You begin to see some emphasis in the Bible on music that's, I mean, the longest book of the Bible is a music book. You ever, you ever thought about that? The book of Psalms was God's word put to music. It's the longest book in the Bible. There are 575 references in scriptures to music. More than heaven and hell combined. Verses on music. You understand that the, the first mention of anything in the Bible musically was a man by the name of Jubal. I believe he played the organ in Genesis, I think it's Genesis chapter either 5 or chapter 9. Jubal. One of the first occupations mentioned in scripture. It's amazing the emphasis that God put on music, but here's why, young people, and I'll leave you with this. Here's why. In Ezekiel, the Bible, in Isaiah, the Bible begins to describe Satan. And the Bible says that the voice of his tabrets and the vials, which are the string instruments, were prepared in thee when thou was created. You understand that Satan is a musical being. 
I've heard people say, Satan was the choir director in heaven. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that because the Bible doesn't say it. But I know this, he's a musical being. And if you're not careful, young people, you're going to allow a musical being to hinder your spiritual growth and not allow the true worship to God where you're going to grow, you're going to flourish. Here's your decision, young people. I, I just want you to think on these things, some of these things that I gave you today. I got a ton of stuff. I wanted to give you some vital signs on Christian music. But I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a point where you're going to have to decide, young people, am I going to get the new song or the old song? Is it going to be the new song or is it going to be the old song? It's going to be a struggle. I guarantee if I, if I were to ask in here, every single one of the adults in this room that are living for God right now, we have all struggled with music. Every, I see every one of them right now nodding their heads. Every single adult, we have struggled with our music. So I don't think you're wicked because you struggle with your music. I don't think you're evil because you, but I do think you're on the road to being there. And some of you need to make some decisions today. Maybe God put his finger on some things. Maybe something I didn't even say, but God's putting his finger on some things. And you know the music that you've been listening to has been stifling your spiritual growth. And I encourage you, get God's music in your life. You'll find a spiritual life. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Lord, I thank you for the ability to learn and to play music. But God, I, I believe if I couldn't sing, I'd love. We got men in our church, you know it, Lord, that they love to sing. They can't carry a tune in the bucket but they love to sing and it affects their spirit. And many of these young people, they're struggling right now with their music. Lord, I pray that you'd help some young people right now. And I know it wasn't a, a sermon type of thing. It was just kind of rapid fire at them. And, but God, I pray that someone would make some decisions right now where they sit. I'm going to get God's music in my life. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, we're not going to have a formal invitation. I'm going to finish my prayer in a second here. The most tragic part about that wrong music that you've been listening to, and some of you, I mean, some of you, you flat out know your music's wrong. It's cussing, it's swearing, it's talking about women, it's talking about men, it's talking about things you know, you, I mean, it's just impure. You, you know it right off the bat. You know, it doesn't take me to convince you about that junk. But the saddest part about it is what it keeps you from. It's keeping you from enjoying your salvation. It's keeping you from enjoying this presence of God in your life. When I surrendered my life to be an evangelist, I told Brother Ramos, I said, uh, I said, God used that song when I lay my Isaac down. I was playing it at the piano at our church. I wasn't even singing it. And I began to weep like a baby. But God used that song. Some of you, is God used it to touch you for a missions conference. And you heard that song, like, here am I, I will go. Or I will be the one. And you surrendered to do the will of God for your life. Man, pump your life and ears and iPod and iPad. Some of you need to go to your youth pastor this afternoon and say, you know what, can you fill my iPad for me? Can you fill my iPod for me with godly music? Some of you need to go back home and throw away some of the trash you've been listening to. And you're going to see God work in your life. Father, I pray that you'd help our young people. We love you, Lord. And I'm not mad at them this morning. I want them to be filled with your spirit. I want them to experience what I've been experiencing for the years of getting involved in Christian music. They don't have to be professionals. They don't have to be uh, the people in the Bible that were musicians. They were, they were preachers. They were singers. They were warriors like David. They weren't a bunch of effeminate men running around. These were warriors, God. And give us a group of men that have a warrior spirit, that have a sword in one hand and a harp in the other hand. Please help our young people with their music in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Calvin. I, I hope you took some stuff from that. There's a lot to get. But some things that I can, I can just reiterate real quick is learn to love the Lord's music. Learn to love godly music. Learn to sing godly music. And the getting involved in participating, not just listening, but the singing and the singing God's music. And I, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, most of you should know this chorus. Sing it with me. I love you, Lord, and I live my life.
Music is a means to a spirit-filled life. And uh, just awesome, awesome stuff. Thank you, Brother Calvin. I'm going to ask Brother Ramos uh, to make his way up to the platform here. I asked him to, to speak uh, uh, briefly as well. And again, these are kind of focus sessions, not split sessions, but just kind of focus sessions. And music, of course, being a huge, uh, uh, powerful tool used for good or bad, and uh, use it for good, obviously. I asked uh, Brother Ramos to preach, or not to preach necessarily, but to, uh, to teach a little bit about uh, godly principles for, uh, for dating and for relationships. And he's going to take a little bit of time and uh, talk about that. Thank you. Take your Bibles. I want you to turn to two places. I get four or five of you guys on the front row to come help me, please. Go ahead and just jump up here. Make sure every teenager gets one of those, please. I'm going to ask Brother and Mrs. Miller if you would help me. And I just met them, I guess yesterday, today. And uh, I promise I won't embarrass you, but can I get both of you to come up for just a moment? Brother Miller, I'm going to give you this here, and you can just sit right where you're sitting. Miss Miller, I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to have you sit in the back corner of, of the uh, auditorium here tonight. We'll get there in just a moment. I'm setting my timer, and I promise three seconds will mean something to me. <laughs> Proverbs chapter number four. Proverbs chapter number four. That has the longest three seconds of my life. All four times. <laughs> I'm gonna have identity issues. I don't know how to pronounce my last name anymore. <laughs> you would be familiar, I believe, with Proverbs chapter four and verse number twenty three. God loves young people. God wrote an entire book of the Bible to young people. It's the book of Proverbs. And uh, there's much instruction, much wisdom that we can get from it. I believe the two sessions, Brother Calvin's on music and the one that we'll uh, share together now are probably the two areas where we lose more young people than any other area working with young people. And um, I believe God just kind of showed me for tomorrow afternoon closing session what he'd like me to talk about. We'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 23, we're given this command, keep thy heart. I've got my timer set. I've got 24 minutes left. When it goes off, we'll be done. So sit up nice and straight. Stay plugged in. The Bible says this, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it, out of the heart, are the issues of life. Then there's one other verse that I want to read to you. It's a few pages to the right. It's in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 26. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 26. It says this, My son, give me thine heart. Every one of you in the auditorium tonight or this afternoon should have been given a heart. And that's just obviously a illustration, an object lesson of the organ that's beating inside your chest. And of course, I think you understand we're not talking about that organ, but we're talking about that which controls our spiritual life, who we are. And God gives the command in Proverbs chapter 4, and he says this to every one of us. Keep your heart. This afternoon, I've given one of these hearts. I've given one to Brother Miller. Brother Miller grew up in uh, western Pennsylvania, about an hour from Pittsburgh, I guess is what he shared with me. And I want every one of you young men, if, if you would, as you follow this object lesson, this illustration, I want you to associate yourself, put yourself in Brother Miller's shoes. All right, Miss Miller's in the back there. And uh, I found out this afternoon that she grew up in South Dakota. She's one of two people in my entire life that I've met from South Dakota. I didn't even know people lived there. But uh, anyways, she's there. And I, I want all of you young ladies, I want you to put yourself in, in her shoes this afternoon. And as we, make app, uh, um, uh, as we uh, give object lesson, make application for that, if you would. Three simple words 
when we think of this thought, keep your heart, the first word is the word danger. The word danger. There's, for every one of us in here this, this afternoon, there's a competition for your heart. There's a competition that's taking place right now for your heart. We're given this command. It says, keep thy heart. Now, sometimes when we hear that word keep, we think, you know, something that we selfishly keep to ourselves or put away, but that's not the idea. The word keep means to guard. It means to protect. It implies a warning against an enemy that might appear. Now, you may not understand this as a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old. You may not understand this, but there are a lot of things that can happen to our hearts. We find in 2 Samuel 15, you don't have to turn there, but Absalom stole the hearts of the children of Israel. Young people, you don't understand this. You may not understand this, but this morning, this afternoon, your heart can be stolen. Your heart can be deceived. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. Above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart can be deceptive, but your heart can also be deceived. Our hearts can be broken. Some of you think you've experience young love and your hearts have been broken at the age of 12 but the fact of the matter is every one of us there's a danger that our hearts might be broken your hearts can be confused there's confusion that takes place we just heard about music and music is one of those things that's used very effectively of the devil to confuse us our hearts can be shattered our hearts can be hurt our hearts can come to the place where where, where it becomes hopeless. So God says to every one of us, young person, keep your heart. Guard it. Protect it. Because there may be an enemy that might appear. And so I would suggest this. When God gives the command to keep your heart, it's not for selfish reasons, but it's for safekeeping. If I were to say to uh, your name right here, front row. Ben? Ben? I'm going to say, I want you to keep my, my phone. I got an iPhone something. I don't even know what I have. I'm not one of those geeks. But uh, anyways, I want you to, the timer's going on. And uh, you keep, keep hold of that. I want you to keep that. Now, you're not leaving this conference with my phone. But while I'm speaking, you're going to keep it. You're going to guard it. You're going to, you're going to protect it. All right, so God says, I don't want you to keep your heart for selfish reasons, but for safeguarding. I want you to keep it. I want you to protect it. Why? Why would God say to keep your heart? Because, number one, you're, you're going to keep your heart because you may have to use it later on. Now, now, let's make application. I've got Brother Miller here. And Brother Miller, let's go back a, a, a few years, and it's his birthday today. And I know he doesn't look any older than he did last night, but he is today. And uh, he, um, he's here, and let's, let's assume he's a 12-year-old young man, and he's in a youth department. He's going, to, uh, he's, he's going through the normal progression as a teenager growing up in western Pennsylvania. And God says to him as he reads the book of, uh, uh, of Proverbs, he says, Brother Miller, he says, keep your heart. And many, many hundreds of miles away, many states away, there's a young lady, and she's 12, 13 years of age, and she's grown up in South Dakota. And, and uh, he says, Miss Miller, he says, I want you, as you're reading through the book of Proverbs, he says, I want you to keep your heart. And at 12, 13 years of age, you may not understand exactly why, but God has a plan, and God has a purpose for that heart that he's given to you. Again, God said, keep thy heart, guard it, protect it. But Brother Miller's going through his junior high years, and he comes to Powerhouse New England as a seventh grader, and he sees a beautiful young seventh grade girl. She's tall, dark, and handsome. No, I'm just joking. She's blonde, she's got blue eyes. I mean, she's just got it all together. And as a seventh grade young man, God said, keep your heart, Brother Rob. But through the course of the three days at Powerhouse Conference, he falls in love. And he takes a piece of that seventh grade heart, and some of you are laughing at me, but you've done it before, and he gives it to that seventh grade girl. God said, Brother Miller, keep your heart because you have to give it later. You, 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 you have to use it later on. And he goes through, and, you know, he, he goes on, and he goes back. She, he goes to Pennsylvania, and she goes to, where are you from? 
she goes back to New Hampshire. And they don't see each other for a whole year, and you know, out of sight, out of mind, you know. And uh, so, you know, he was in love for three days at Powerhouse Youth Conference. But he, go, he grows up, and he gets a little bit older, and he goes to the ninth grade. And he goes to summer camp, and he meets another young lady. And, uh, man, she's more beautiful than the first. And, uh, man, she's got it going on. She can sing, and she's athletic, and all of these. I'm sorry. But uh, anyways, <laughs> he sees this young lady, and he gives her a piece of his heart. And maybe during his ninth grade year uh, or his 10th grade year of high school, there's some of that wrong music that Brother Calvin just addressed. And, man, he, he's got a, a piece of his heart, and, and he takes and he gives a piece of that heart to the music. And maybe in 11th or 12th grade, there's a competition for his heart. And all the while, he's going to camps and conferences, and he's meeting other young ladies, and he's just continually giving a piece of his heart. They give that maybe in the 10th, 11th grade, uh, uh, God's speaking to him about going into ministry, but he's a football player, a linebacker, and uh, he gives a piece of his heart to, to athletics and all of these things. He's just giving pieces of his heart away. What did God say? God said, keep your heart. Right. Why? Not for selfish reasons, but for safekeeping because God's having you keep your heart and guard your heart and protect your heart because down the road he has a plan for you. He has a plan where he wants you. You're going to have to use that heart. And all the way across the country, in no man's land, South Dakota, there's a young lady who she's just been doing it right. She read Proverbs 4 and verse number 23. And so when she went to the conferences and somebody was trying to give a piece of her, she wasn't taking a piece of her heart and giving it to that young man. She wasn't giving pieces of her heart to the wrong music and to the things of this world. She just was keeping her heart. She was guarding it and protecting it because her mama and her daddy and her youth pastor and her preacher said, listen, keep your heart, keep your heart. There's a competition. You better guard it. You may protect it. Because she understood that later on she may have to use it. Why should we keep our heart? Because not only later on we may have to use it, but because... One day we may have to give it away. Miss Miller, would you stand and would you walk to the back of this, uh, the, this center aisle here? There was a day, how long have you all been married? 11 years, would you come with me, Brother Miller? There was a day 11 years ago where Brother Miller stood at the front of this aisle and he was there with a the preacher. And Miss Miller was at the back of the aisle and Daddy walked her down that aisle. She was walking down that aisle. And both of these young people had grown up in church. And both of those young people had heard people stand up and preach and say, Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Keep your heart. Because one day, they would walk down. They would meet in an, at an aisle in a church. And she had something that she was going to give to Brother Miller. When it was time for her to give her heart to someone, this is what she had to give. But here's Brother Miller. Seventh grade girl, ninth grade girl, the world's music, athletics. God told them both, keep your heart. Because one day you're going to have to give it away. Because one day, if you'd come and you'd stand by your husband, because one day you're going to have to use it, young person. God had both of these young people keep their heart not only to give it away or give it to each other, but because they were going to use it in investing their lives in young people. Right. You see, every teenager that's come through the doors of their church and have been a part of their youth department and have... They've taken the youth conferences and summer camp. You know what they've done? They've taken the heart that they guarded and that they protected as young people and they kept it not for selfish reasons, but so that one day they could give it to each other and then one day together they could give it to you. Yes, and there are young people in this room today that when it's time for you to stand at an altar, how much time? When it's time for you to stand at an altar, this is what you're going to have to give to your spouse. When it's time for you to step into a ministry, to be a youth pastor, to be a Christian school teacher, 
to be a coach, to be a pastor. This is what you're, I, I don't know that I can prove this for the Bible, from the Bible, but I wonder if our life ends when we have no more of our heart left to give. I, I've thought about many times how I'm going to die. I know that's morbid, but I've thought about that. I don't want to drown and I don't want to go in a, burn, in a fire. Those are the two ways I, I, just, I want to go nice. But you know how I really want to go? I want to go giving my heart to teenagers and to young single adults and to families and to God that when it's my time to go, there's no more of my heart left. And God just says, okay, I'm going to go take you. Well, let me make a few comments to you. We'll be done this afternoon. I'm not telling you who's the right person. I'm not, I, I'm not advocating any of those things. I'm just going to say, give you a couple principles. Number one, don't give your heart away too soon, too many times, or to the wrong person. Listen, I, I understand. I understand that 13, 14, 15 years of age, young men start to notice young ladies. If you don't, we have bigger problems. But I just say this, don't buy into Hollywood's philosophy that you have to be going steady at 12 and 13 and 14 years of age. Don't give your heart away too soon. Don't give it away too many times. Don't give it to the wrong person. Number two, don't ever give your heart to somebody who has not first given their heart to God. Can, can I say that again? Don't ever give your heart to somebody who has not first given their heart to God. Young lady, listen to me, listen to me. I don't care how handsome he is. I don't care how strong he is. I don't care how athletic he is. If he doesn't have a heart for God, if he's not given his heart for God, don't you ever give your heart to him. Listen, young man, I don't care how beautiful she is. I don't care how talented she is. I don't care how good she makes you feel. If she's never given her heart to God, don't you ever give your heart to that young lady. Statement number three. You can never give your heart to God if everyone else or everything else already has it. We read Proverbs 23 and verse number 26, and it says this, My son, give me thine heart. I want you to understand this afternoon, young people, that you will serve whoever or whatever has your heart. If God has your heart, Brother, Brother Miller and I were just talking about this at lunch. We focus so many times as pastors and youth pastors and, and, and leaders of young people, we focus so many times on cleaning up the outside and yeah. make it, listen, if we would go after the heart, all of the outside stuff would take care of itself. God says, my son, give me thine heart. Right, right. Right. But you can't ever give your heart to God if you've already given it to everyone else or everything else. Statement number four. Waiting is worth it. Don't trade a lifetime of godly love for a quick moment of pleasure you will live to deeply regret. Can I say this and just be very blunt? I'll be, I won't be blunt. I'll be very careful. I have a filter, unlike Brother Tim. But uh, anyways, <laughs> love waits. I, I, I'm sorry. Lust is interested in what it can get. Love is only interested in what it can give. Listen, I, I, I don't know Brother Mrs. Miller well, but I guarantee you, they are thrilled beyond all explanation this afternoon because they waited and they did it God's way. Waiting is worth it. Statement number whatever is next. Don't ask for somebody's heart if you are going to lead them the wrong way. Don't ask for somebody's heart if you're going to lead them the wrong way. One of the most sobering responsibilities that I have on just about a daily basis is I have young people that come into my office and ask for counsel. One of the practices that I, I, I try to remember to do every single time before that young person comes in and asks counsel 
is I ask God, just very quickly ask God to give me wisdom because some of the young people that come into my office, they may take my advice. And I don't want to get the heart of young people if I'm not going to lead them God's way. Young man, before you ever get a girl's heart, you better make a commitment to her, to God, to her family, to her pastor that you're going to lead her God's way. Next statement. You only have one heart to give. Make sure you give it to the right people. I'll say this to our youth workers, our youth leaders. You cannot train someone who will not give you their heart. You can't train them if they won't give you your heart. And here's my challenge to every young person, every adult in here. Most of you, by your testimony this week, have given indication that at one point in your life you gave your soul to Christ. Why won't you give them your heart? There's a danger, there's a competition that's taking place for your heart. Number two, the word is diligence. I'll just give you the, the, the thought here. That's the care for your heart. We're going to understand there's a competition, so you better take care of your heart. There's examination. David prays in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and try me, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way. Every single day, we need to make sure that there's, if there's any sin, if there's anything in our hearts that would keep us from being right with God, that we're examining it. There's regulation that takes place. Paul says, uh, uh, he talks about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, about uh, 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 running the race, and there's some rules that he's going to live by lest he preached to everybody else and he himself became a castaway. We need to regulate our heart. If there's some things that aren't right, we better get them right. And then there's glorification. Make sure everything that we're doing, the music we're listening to, we just heard about, it's about glorifying God. Right. It's not about getting on. So there's the danger. There's a competition for the heart. There's the diligence, taking proper care for the heart. And then the development is the third word, and that's the conquest of the heart. If, if, if we will keep our heart, if we'll guard it, if we'll protect it, we'll have no problem with our tongue, we'll have no problem with our eyes, we'll have no problem with our feet, we'll have no problem with wrong relationships, wrong things because we've taken proper care of the heart. I'm done. The Bible says this, keep your heart. We can make many applications to this, but the application this afternoon is to that of dating. Brother Miller, as a 12, 13-year-old young man growing up in western Pennsylvania, probably had no clue this young lady existed. But you know what he did? He kept his heart. He kept his heart. Miss Miller had no clue before she was even Miss Miller. She had no clue that a Stephen Miller existed and that God would cross their paths at some point and God would give them 11 years of marriage and uh, give them 11 years of ministry and investing in the lives of young people. They had no clue. But as young people, somewhere along the line, they made a decision to keep their heart, to guard it, to protect it. And now, many years later, God's put them in a position. He's given them a wonderful relationship as husband and wife, given them children. He's given them a wonderful opportunity to serve Him in ministry, where every single day of their lives, not just Brother Miller, but Brother and Mrs. Miller, every single day of their lives are giving pieces of their heart to you. I told you at the beginning of the conference, I can't sing like that guy. I can't play the piano like that guy. I can't sing like Brother Miller. I can't, but, but I, there's one thing that I can do. And as God has allowed me for 20 plus years now to be involved with teenagers and college students, I can give them a piece of this. As a basketball coach, as a football coach, as a soccer coach, whatever I've coached, I've had just one thought, one philosophy. By the end of the ball game, your jersey better be soaking wet. <laughs> you better come back after the game is over, win or lose. You've put 180% of your effort and energy into that ball game. I don't have a lot of patience for guys who get back on the bus after the ball game and they're jumping around, especially if we've lost the game and they've got all this energy. I'm like, something's wrong. If you have all that energy now, where was it a few minutes ago? 
But if I'm going to encourage athletes to give 180% when it comes to a ball game, that doesn't even matter when it comes to eternity. How much more important is it that I, the opportunity God has given me in ministry, to give it with all of my heart? You can only give all of your heart when you get to this stage of life if you make the decisions as a young person to keep your heart. Listen, I understand. I was a month away from getting engaged. And God said it's the wrong person. That was an easy conversation. That was a piece of my heart that I gave away that I'll never get back. But Hollywood, the world's philosophy, it says, give it away at 12, get away at 13. You got to be all of these things. Listen, why don't we follow the advice that we're given from the wisest man that ever lived in the book of, book of Proverbs? And he says this, keep your heart. Why? Because one day you're going to have to use it. One day you're going to have to give it away. Listen, young men, listen. Every young lady that walks down the aisle, this is what they deserve to get from you. Listen, every young lady, there's a man waiting at the end of the aisle. This is what he deserves to get from you. Would you keep your heart, Brother Ramos? Thank you, Brother Ramos. Thank you, Brother Ramos. Let's, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Two powerful, powerful truths. I'm focusing on this one here. Keep your heart. You're going to need it. You're going to have to use it one day. I want you to take just a minute and talk to the Lord and ask him if he would help you keep your heart. Protect it. For when you're going to need it, when you're going to have to give it away someday, to the person you're going to marry, to the people you're going to serve, ask God to help you protect and keep your heart. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us the perfect example of how to love. And that it's about what we can give, not about what we can get. God, you gave us that ability. Help us to use it wisely. Help us to keep our heart, as we heard so eloquently put, God. And, and help us to be focused on you. Be focused on what you have for us, God. And if we'll give our heart to you, we know that we'll be able to give it to whomever you want us to serve and whomever you want us to marry and, and, and uh, the different relationships down the road, God. I, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to use that heart wisely. And I thank you for what we've heard this afternoon. I pray that you'd help us to take it to heart and apply it to our lives, God. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ramos, thank you so much. That was just, that was powerful and very, very helpful. I appreciate that. And uh, we have a uh, uh, little bit of time. We've got a couple hours this afternoon. Brother Tim's going to come up and give you some announcements here, kind of give you some instruction as to what we're going to do. Just because we're going into a little bit more relaxed, fun time doesn't mean you get to allow all the stuff you just heard to leave your brain. Okay? So some of you taking notes. That's awesome. That's a good thing and helps you to remember what you've heard. Uh, there is a spot in your little uh, booklet there for you to take notes. We gave you a pen and, and that booklet as well. We, I hope you will. Uh, if you haven't been, I hope you will take notes. And that's a way to help you remember those different things. But we have some games and stuff this afternoon. Brother Tim, come give some announcements, please. All right. Before we do that, I just want to let you know, as far as right now, the total points, both teams are within 2,000 points of each other. It is extremely close. It's awesome, okay? Here's a couple things, a couple quick announcements. We are gonna be playing some games here for about the next two hours or so, okay? We've got all kinds of different stuff. Those of you that signed up for the actual video game tournaments, that is gonna take place upstairs where the bathrooms are at, that hallway there. Uh, it's room 206. If you look for the room that is the most obnoxious colors, blue and orange, you've ever seen put into one classroom, you're in the right place, okay? 
both, there are two TVs set up in there. We have both Nintendo Switches running simultaneously. If you signed up for that tournament, go there first. There's also the uh, basketball shootout, ping pong, and foosball. Those tournaments will be kind of come and go. And what we're gonna do with those is winner will stay. Okay, so if you get to the basketball shootout, you play against somebody else, you win, you stay, and we're gonna give points away, not just to your team, but extra entries for the ultimate giveaway to your church for the longest win streaks of the day. Okay, and that goes for foosball, uh, basketball, and ping pong. So longest win streak throughout the, the afternoon will end up winning there. Okay, Gaga, we are gonna give, we're not gonna give away points for Gaga because that usually goes too quickly, but every time somebody wins, we're gonna write down your church, you get an extra entry for your church. Does that make sense? Okay, all the windows are open in the Gaga room. Adults, I would advise you to stay away from that room. The smell will permeate your soul. And they haven't even played yet, okay? Couple other things really quickly. There is one other room, when you first walk into that hallway, the first room on the right, it is our preschool classroom. It's red, yellow, and blue, real bright colors. There are five TVs with five different video game systems in there. There's no tournament in there. That's just open for anybody to play a game. If you go in, play a game, play a round of a game, and then get up and play something else so somebody else can take a turn. Okay, we don't want you sitting there taking over Mario Kart and you're there for the next two hours, just you playing. We don't care. Okay, so let everybody have a chance to play there. Again, there's five different systems in there. We do ask that you try to stay in that hallway for the next little bit. What we are gonna do about 4.45, I'll come through and I'm extremely loud. I will start yelling and announcing when we're gonna serve dinner. When we make that announcement about dinner, go downstairs, same way you did for lunch. We have pizza and a bunch of other stuff for dinner tonight. When you're done eating, we want you to change clothes into what you're gonna wear to Sky Zone tonight. Okay, some of you have already changed, that's fine. We do encourage you to wear your shirts uh, that we gave you for tonight. That way when we get to the evening service, soon as that's done, we can all load up and go directly over there and everybody's already ready to go. We got it so far? Yeah. Okay, the last thing I wanna tell you is, if you want extra points for your team, I can be bribed. I take cash, check, and all major credit cards. I don't give the credit cards back. Okay, are we good? Yeah. Any questions? No. I'm not going to answer them anyways. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to let the adults go first. Go, all the adults, get up and go. I'm just trying to drag this out because it's fun. All the adults, get out of here. Go, go, go. Nope. All right, go, go, go. All the youth leaders and adults, teenagers, I did not dismiss you. Sit down, sit down. All the adults, youth workers, go. All right. Shh. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have graduated from high school this year, you can go. If you have already graduated from high school, you can go.